What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Got a brother that spent a lot of time, too much time, in federal prison, been around some things, done some things, definitely been in some dangerous situations. But Andy, tell the people who you are, and we'll talk about your TikTok and how they can find your stories over there, too. All right. I appreciate you, Chad. Um, my name's Andy. I spent 22 years in federal prison. I was at 11 different institutions over those 22 years. Um, back in 2000, I caused a train crash, um, an accident, dumbass kid move, um, played a prank, changed a switch. The train came along and crashed and it killed one of the conductors and injured another one. So they charged me with a crime. It's actually called train wrecking. Uh, doesn't exist anymore. They got rid of it due to my case. Um, and, uh, I faced the death penalty for six months. Uh, then for the next year, they told me I had a mandatory life sentence and I ended up getting a, not a plea bargain. I, I openly pled to uh, 25 years. Uh, and that's the sentence I got. 20 years old, man. What's your life like? Even though you're doing this bullshit on the train, what are you doing at 20 years old with your life? Man, I, I actually had a really, I had a really blessed childhood. Um, I grew up the son of a doctor. Mother was a school teacher. Um, I had good grades in school. Um, I was a two sport varsity athlete. I swam and played water polo. I was recruited to play water polo in college. And I was going to South Dakota to go to South Dakota State University. Um, and I was going to play ball for them. But uh, this happened. So you had your life in order pretty much, and you make a stupid decision, and it cost you 25 years of your life at 20 years old. Right. One stupid decision can change not only your life, but other people's too. Yeah. I mean, the conductor, I'm sure he probably had a family, right? Yep, I had a family, four children. Yep. Oh, bro. So you're 20 years old. You make this mistake. They're talking about giving you the death penalty. What's going through your mind? What is it like for a 20-year-old sitting in a county jail, and they're talking about, bro, they're about to give you the death penalty? It was unbelievable because, you know, we were raised up to believe that the death penalty is for, you know, those hardened murderers who intentionally kill people. When you're sitting there and you know it was an accident, you know you didn't intend to kill anybody, but they're still telling you, hey, check this out. You got to go through this process because the feds, the way they do the death penalty is a little different than uh, the states. It's not just the decision. They have a hearing. Your pro their prosecutor and your lawyer present mitigating and aggravating circumstances. And then that committee goes to a committee in Washington, D.C., where they present it all over again. And those findings go to the attorney general. Thank goodness Janet Reno decided I was not eligible for the death penalty. So that was off the table six months after my arrest. Look, let's just call it what it is. It's a horrible crime. This guy dies. He's got four kids. He's got a wife. You know, it's a horrible crime. Yeah. But you take a 20-year-old and give them the death penalty because they changed the switch. I understand it costs someone their life. But it yeah. isn't like you were out there maliciously and you intended to kill this dude. You probably had no idea what would happen or that it could even be that serious, right? No. I, I thought I was sending a train to Nebraska like a joke. Like, oh, we're going to have to stop and turn around. I was horrified when I found out the train crashed. And then like the next day when I found out somebody died, I was like, oh, my God, I was like, I'm a 20 year old kid. You know what I mean? I'm just the worst I'd ever done with some drugs. How did, they <laughs> you know find I mean? out, how did they find out it was you? Oh, my roommates told on me. Yeah, they went to a lawyer, then the lawyer and then went to the FBI. They were with me when I did it. But. They said they told the FBI that I told them about it so they wouldn't be implicated in the crime. So now you're 20 years old. You end up copping out to the 25-year mm -hmm. sentence. You're on your way to federal prison. What's going through a 20-year-old's mind with a 25-year sentence when you just had this life in front of you? You know, you think you're getting, a, you know, going to college. You're going to play ball there. You know, you're going to be an engineer. You're thinking all these great things. You got a good family, I suppose. You said you had a good upbringing. And yeah. now you're going to prison with a 25-year sentence. Man, it was it was shell shock. I'm, I had to relearn the entire environment. You know what I mean? I had to learn the, the mentality of being a convict because I was a citizen. I didn't know like the words like bitch and punk. Those didn't mean anything to me, but I come to an environment where those are fight on site words. It was a whole, I mean, I got chin checked over that. I don't know how many times, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's no secret. You end up, you know, tipping up eventually in prison, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll get we'll get to that in a minute. We'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But you're yeah. walking into this prison. What's your first federal prison? Uh, Lompoc USP. 
That's when Lon Polk was jumping. What year did you walk in there? 2002. So you were there probably when Eddie yeah. Boy was there, and Eddie Boy ended up – he almost yeah. killed a dude over there on the yard. Yeah. Eddie Boy, Donnie Thrash was there. Big Mark was there. There was a lot of a real, a real solid dudes there, and it was uh, no joke. You know, it was it was only two penitentiaries in California at the time. This was before Victorville had opened. So you had Atwater and you had Lompoc. Well, Lompoc was the more active at the time because it was the older joint. You remember how those older joints, they tended to be more um, with the business back then. Now it's not really that way. Now they just fluctuate wherever is more active, just where whoever's at, you know. You know, a 20-year-old walks in there, you, you know, you're pretty much a good kid. You, you make a, a horrible decision. What makes a 20-year-old say, you know what, man, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a gang up? Is it because you feel like your life's over? This is your life now? Um, I kind of got into the, the Odinist group, the religion, and a lot of those guys were involved in gang life. And I had seen at the time a lot of the gangs, I didn't really like their get down. I'm not going to put anybody out there. But there were some, some gangs that would like use younger guys. And this one kind of like put their arm around me and I hung out with them for probably five years was armed. And they never even asked me to join. They were just like, you're our buddy. And, and that ended up being why I ended up joining with them because they never even pressed an issue with me. They were just like, treated me like I was one of them. And I thought that was pretty cool. With that 25 year sentence, is there times when you're like, damn, man, my life's over, man. Everything I dreamed of, it's all over with. Yeah, about halfway through. When I got to about the 10-year mark, I was like, you know what? This is my life. Because, I, you know, you don't really remember stuff before you're 10 years old. So you figure from 10 to 20, that was the only time I remember being free. So from 20 to 30, I'm like, man, basically half of what I remember is prison. So at, at that point, it felt like that was it. Before you go to prison, drug addicted? Ever touch drugs? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Before I went to prison, I would dabble. I smoked a little pot. Um, I had tried meth here and there, done some party drugs like ecstasy and stuff. But when I got in, it was wide open. And that became my coping mechanism. It's, it, it's probably one of the worst things about prison for me was the only way to blow off steam to kind of like get away from the violence and the danger and the fear and all that was to allow yourself with drugs. Well, after so many years of that, it becomes a coping skill, a habit. And then that habit is what I'm struggling to break right now. Yeah. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about that. What, mm -hmm. what did your parents do? Uh, they, they were very supportive. Um, they would come visit me when I had visits. Of course I lost because of being a young, dumb kid. I raised my hand for everything for the first five or six years. And I didn't have visits from 2004 to 2010. So as of 2010, I started getting my mind wrapped around, hey, you know, I got to like look out for my family too. I need to be able to get visits and have my phone and all that stuff. So I started calming down. And their support on the outside is what really gave me that drive to kind of straighten up and not get involved in every little train wreck that came along. When we talk about raising your hand, right? Tell the people what that mm -hmm. means in federal prison to raise your hand. So in federal prison, when something hits the yard that they consider work, um, a sex offender hits the yard, a dude who's a, a rat um, has done something that he can't walk the yard for, they look for volunteers. And so you raise your hand to go handle that piece of business, whether it's beat them up or whatever. And when you talk about putting in work, I mean, what have you done? Um, I've done seven removals on child molesters. That was my favorite. Anytime a pedophile would come through, that was something that I really wanted to get involved with. I have a serious dislike for sex offenders. Um, well, six pedophiles and one rapist. The rapist happened to be from my hometown and he had been sliding through under the radar for a long time. And I felt really disrespected that he'd been on the yard for three years and nobody knew. So I ended up doing that one on my own in Mendota. So you're in the penitentiary. You got to put in work. I mean, what type wow. of work have you put in? You ever had to put that knife in anybody? Uh, I have. Um, I'm not really going to say which joint because, you know, I don't know what happened. You know how it goes. They, they don't ever tell us if the guy lived or died. So um, not knowing how the victims turned out, I don't want to talk about 
certain certain things. But yeah, I have. I've had to push that knife. More, more. The scarier issue though is when a riot jumps off, and you have those weapons everywhere because you don't know where anything's coming from. When you're going to put in that piece of work, that's not so scary because typically that guy's unarmed and doesn't know it's coming. But when that riot's going, it's like Braveheart out there. You know what I mean? Atwater was like that. What riot? Where were you, were you in a riot at? at the floor at Florence. Atwater. Who was it? Who was the who crashed over there? Uh, the white boys in the Mexican. It was uh, it was vicious. That one went for like forty five minutes. They had some rookies up in the tower. They didn't know what to do. It went forever. It felt like it went all day. Was it over? Um, oh man, it was a long story. But this dude went to the shoe. His photo album came up missing. The the Mexican dudes had the hot trash. They they would get stuff out of the hot trash. You know, you're not supposed to, but they got it out. They were nice enough to pull all dudes' pictures out and take them back to the white boys and say, here. But one of his brothers said, hey, we want his photo album too. Because, you know, those photo albums were hard to get or whatever. They said, no, you know, finders keepers. We gave him his pictures back. Well, they didn't want to let that go. The yard reps at the time had kind of worked it out to where it was going to be good. But the Oregon Cats were feeling some kind of way. And they didn't want to discipline the guy who went and snatched the album from the dude. Because they had given the album back to the Mexican. So when the Oregon dudes told the Mexican guys, no, get bent, we're not, we're not disciplining them, it jumped. Of course, you're going to expect that. They felt disrespected because they said, you're not, we're not going to live by our deal. You know, being a gang member, I mean, them armed dudes, I mean, I've been around AJ, Raz, Chad, Chad Sutherland. Yeah. I've been around a lot of them cats, right? Mm -hmm. And they do push that knife. They don't mind, you know, weapons, whatever it is, right. they don't mind. What right. goes through your mind when you have to go on a mission? You know, you're you're going on this mission and they're like, yo, bro, you got to, you know, you got to put that knife in this dude. Are you thinking well, I you might end up with a life sentence? Yeah. But, well, that's the first thing that pops into your head. You're like that fear. You're like, oh, man, how are we going to do this so it's not on camera? Because you know how the penitentiary is. 99% of the place is on camera. So you don't want to do it on camera. Um, I was always like kind of spotting blind spots and things to where you could try to go in and get it. Because typically... If it's not on camera, they won't actually press the charge. If it's on camera, yeah, they will. So I try. We try to avoid those those camera angles and things like that. You ever hit somebody up and feel bad about it later on? Like, damn, bro. Absolutely. There was a dude that we had to beat down, and it wasn't a knife attack. It was it was a beat down, but they got him. And and unfortunately, I was up in line. It wasn't a raise your hand incident. It was. I had been there that so long and I hadn't done any work at that point. And a guy had to be removed that had checked in at another spot over. I don't even know what somebody said, a drug debt, somebody said something else, but the guy was really nice and he was really helping everybody out. And then a month after a guy had shown up from that same spot and said he didn't check in. So that one bothered me for a while. You're putting hands and feet on the dude. Is he yelling, trying to fight back? He's like, come on, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, he was, he was saying, what are you doing? Why are you hitting me? And that's what made me think this whole thing's true. Because if a guy knows that he's checked in somewhere or he's done something foul, he's not asking why. He's just trying to get away or fight back. Let me ask you this. Why are gang members, right? And usually, man, a lot of white gang members are brutal. The, the natives I've seen do. I mean, everybody does brutal shit. But there's some guys that are at the top of the food chain. Why is there, I mean, why are these dudes so brutal, man? What, what goes into their heart where they're like, no compassion, they don't give a shit, it's balls to the wall, I'm going to destroy this dude. What makes people operate like that? I'm, I think I think people out here watching this video want to know that. They hear all these stories, now that all these cell phones are seeing all this violence in these prison systems. What goes into your thought process? Why is there no compassion? Why do people become animals? I think, personally, you're putting down a demonstration. You're doing something for everybody to see that's so aggressive and so violent. And it says, hey, don't fuck with us. Don't come at us because this is what we do. This is the kind of and I think as the white boys, as a car in general in prison, go so hard because we're so small as a group in prison. So we want to put down that demo and be like, look, you mess with us. This is what comes. This is what we do to our own. What do you think we'll do to you? That's what I believe. Do you think that? intimidates other cars other groups 
I think to a certain extent it does, especially among gangs, because I've seen one gang will go take out their trash and then the next gang will do it even tougher. And it'll be a, like a one upsmanship. I, I, it's happened a bunch of times. I've seen it down in Texas a lot because there's so many gangs in Texas. What was the worst prison you ever been in? Um, I'm going to say Victorville. I'm going to say Victorville. You told a little story on your TikTok about what happened while you were in Victorville, right? I think it was with. No. Did you tell the story about Snow? I uh, I called him Frosty, but yeah, it was about him. Um, well, my fault. Was, I, I didn't know that. You, I didn't know that part. So. It's all right. It's tell all right. people what happened. Tell people how violent and how crazy this federal prison system in is, and this white car. What happens? So, at Victorville, there was a lot of drama. They had um, the brand was on the yard, and they were running the yard. And there was an issue between the Paisas, which is the Mexican nationals, and the skinhead out of um, Oregon. And the skinhead wasn't wrong. The Mexican dude who was gay walked into his cell uninvited, drunk, and propositioned the guy. So the guy put hands on him. Didn't really beat him up bad, but like popped him up and tossed him out of his cell. Well, Victorville was, you don't you don't touch anybody else. Like, like if you have an issue, you take it to the car, the car handles it. So it was an issue. They took it to the heads of the yard. The heads of the yard said, go tune them up. And they did. But it wasn't to their liking. So they went out to the yard and we had a little, a little brawl among the white boys. And we all went to the shoe and most of us ended up getting back out. Way in the midst of that, the yard shot caller had told SIS that guy can't come back out. The skinhead who had put hands on the Mexican. Well, you can't do that. So when their brothers heard about that up in ADX, they sent word back and said, remove that guy. Well, with that gang, you don't remove anybody. You remove them from breathing. And that's what they did. They, they cut his head off. You were on the yard when that happened? Yeah, we all got locked up over it. Everybody from California. And what they use to take his head off in federal prison? How do you get someone's head off, bro? Man, they had they had uh, a bone crusher that was razor edge. This thing was I seen it. <laughs> it was about probably ten inch a blade, and they I mean one guy word on the yard was one guy wrapped him up in a bear hug, and the other guy started stabbing him in the chest. And then once he had stopped breathing, they cut his head off. You would never think that something like that would happen in federal prison, right? Right. Well, you always hear club fed and all that, but the prisons I at, I was at, they're not club fed. They were they were active like level four California yard. They were supervision. Wow. I mean, it's it's crazy to even think that some, you know, things like that happen in federal prison. Like, where are the cops at? You know, people that are watching this have never been involved in the prison system. They're like, where the hell were the cops at? It had to take a while to do that, right? Oh, yeah. They didn't find his body until four o'clock count. They did this right around. Uh, they came in on the end of lunch and they left out on the 130 move and they didn't find his body till four o'clock count. And Snow had some juice, too, right? A lot of juice. A lot of juice. He he had he had pull on that yard. Made some bad, you know, pe- people say he made some bad calls over there and he oppressed some of his own people, treated people like shit, right? He was disliked. He was disliked pretty roundly by everybody, including his own brothers. I do not think they cared much when they said get rid of this guy. And someone raised their hand, said, I'll do it. No problem. Yeah, right. Right. Two, actually. <laughs> I was on the bus with one of them. Anyway, yeah, let's uh, let's talk about this. You talked a little bit about addiction, right? You get you right. kind of get caught up in addiction in prison, and it's kind of like your coping mechanism. I mean, what what are you using? I was using anything that got around, but towards the end of my sentence, I got on K two. I was using spice a lot. That's okay. just vicious. What about your bros, man? Were, were they against that shit? Yeah, this is why I'm out. I got out of arm because they opened the doors. They said, if you have a drug addiction and you can't stop, we are now straight edge. So I left in um, 2020. I got out in 2020. I wrote the letter. I said, look, I have a drug issue. 
I am not going to drag the car down. Um, and Richard Scutari, who was my sponsor in, uh, wrote me back and said, hey, no hard feelings. I appreciate that you don't bring uh, the, the drug use in, into our group. And honestly, you know what? They're all good guys and everything, but I'm not really feeling that. Um, I'm not really feeling that kind of hate anymore. You know what I mean? Talk about feeling that kind of hate. Did you feel bad leaving? Like, damn, these were my bros. Did you feel kind of like sad? Like this was your family and you're walking away? Yeah, I did. I had a, I had a lot of really close relationships with a lot of those guys. I still talk to a few. Um, I'm still in really good standing with a lot of those guys. Like even um, I, I just wrote AJ a while ago and he still writes every so often. The thing I really love about those guys is they have never asked me for money or anything. Like, I know how it is in there. You just can't go out and get a job. And they know that I'm out and I'm trying to build my life. Not asking me for money is a big deal to me because I'm struggling, you know, just getting out of rehab and, and just doing a, 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 a skid bid. I'm just putting my life together. I'm going to donate something to you. I don't pay people for interviews, but I'm going to donate something to you. I know you're trying to get your rent together, so you got a place to live, right? Yeah, yeah, man. I'm 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 getting there. I'm doing Uber Eats, but yeah, it's it's a struggle. <laughs> it's hey a man, struggle. if you're watching the you. show tonight, I'm gonna put your cash app up and tell them if they're gonna donate to us tonight, donate to you. You're struggling. You know, I know some people might have issues with the addiction thing, but really you're trying to get some money so you have yeah. a place to live. So we're gonna do something for you too. I know what well, it's just like, so man. we're clear. I just finished rehab and I'm seven months clean right now. So I I attend meetings and yeah, I'm we all struggle. If you've ever been in addiction, you struggle for the rest of your life. Every day I get up and say, not today. And I know JD delay looked out for you. He tries to help you out a little bit, right? Yeah. JD is my boy. He's, he's the closest thing I have to a real sponsor. Um, he's really been a confidant, really kind of guided me through this whole social media thing. I love that man to death. He answers people, bro. He, he does. He actually yeah. you know, calls you, calls people. He answers people. Not a yeah. bad dude, man. He actually gives a fuck. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He cares. He cares a lot. For sure. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, this Mexican thing that happened, right? I do want, I do want to touch on it. I want people to know what it's like when there's a riot. Are you out there on the yard afraid, scared? I mean, what's going through your mind? Well, when we walked out there, my side of the yard, we didn't think anything was wrong. We thought it was all, all good. I was out there in my rec shoes, my shorts. I had my little workout bag, but I had no weapons because – the cops knew something was going on, so they were real hard on the metal detectors. So I didn't even bring what we call a friendly, which is like a plastic made knife or anything like that. I went out there almost bare. And normally there's a stash of knives on the yard somewhere. And we had one at Atwater, but the Mexicans knew where it was. And as soon as they went out to the yard, they stood on top of it with their knives out. We couldn't get to anything out there on the yard. I knew then. As soon as I saw that, because that was our area, when they were in our area, standing on top of our stash pot, I said, this is bad. We're in trouble. And I was terrified. Anybody who says they're not, is a liar. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What Mexican group was it? Southsiders, Pisces? Who was it? Uh, it was the Pisces and the Southsiders rode with them. You're probably surprised. They were thinking, damn, man, West Coast, I thought the white dudes ran with the Mexicans. I was a little surprised, but at the same time, um, you can't expect somebody the, the the only thing we could have hoped for was that they would stay out of it because you can't expect somebody to ride against their own race. Um, that's one thing about West Coast politics is race trumps gang. And that's typically how it's always been. Um, so when the Southsiders jumped, I wasn't super surprised. I was a little bummed because I had some really good friends that I had been doing time with for over 15 years that rode against us on that deal. Um, I didn't see him in the melee, but it, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? And I ran into one of them after and it wasn't a big deal. It was like, Hey, you remember that time? Yeah, I do. Ain't that crazy how dudes are just like, Hey man, remember that time we were trying to kill each other and now we're on this yard? Yeah. Yeah. We're friends again. Yeah, totally. I think people in federal prison look for reasons just to do violent acts just to pass time. I absolutely do. Especially shot callers. It's like, they're always digging for something that's not there. They don't like somebody, you know, if, if you think about half the removals, it's just because somebody lost a popularity contest. It's like high school where everybody has a knife. 
But I thought all this convict code was mind your own business. Don't be in people's business. Don't talk about people. They, they say that's the code, but really, it's really not, right? It's only the code when it benefits them. That, 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 that's one of those things with the code that kind of like, well, we'll tell the cops this guy can't come out of the shoe to benefit everybody else. So we don't have to deal with that issue. That's against the code too, but it happens all the time. Not right. You're out there on the yard for that ride. Do you get hit? Yeah. Yeah. I caught a, I caught a little grazer in my arm and I caught one in the back. Um, just above, just like right on the hip bone, a couple inches higher. It would have been a kidney shot. It would have been bad. They hit you with a pick knife. It was, a, I think it was an ice pick. I think it was an ice pick. So you, you know, you're out here on the yard and, and I know that, you know, you guys believe in 1488, the 14 words, all of that stuff. Right. I mean, when you're out here on the battlefield, do you feel like, and it, it's literally a battlefield where people, you know, people have lost their lives out here on these yeah. battlefields. Do you feel like you're one of them Vikings out there, bro, in the moment? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it is a surreal experience. I think, Probably only people who have been in like combat or or some sort of brawl like that understand the how the fear and the terror actually becomes like a euphoria. It's weird. But yes, yes, you do feel like it's um some sort of religious experience almost. It's weird. It's not like a movie. I mean, you don't get hit in the back with an ice pick and fall to the ground. And no, nah, nah. I mean, you get hit in the, with an ice pick, and what are you doing? You're fighting back, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, when I I didn't realize I got hit in the arm, but the one in the back, it kind of stopped, and it felt like I got punched really hard. And I didn't realize until later that I actually had a break in my skin, a little a little poke. I thought that they, I actually thought I got hit with a lock on a belt because it was like really hard. I've been stabbed in the back, USP Lee. I know what it feels like to get hit with an ice pick. Yeah. It, yeah. And in the, it's later when it hurts. When you get to the hole, that's when it really hurts, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How many times you laid in your cell with that 25-year sentence after you get jammed up, right? Because this is something that, you know, no prison channels probably really talk about. You get, mm-hmm. you know, you get hit up, you're in, you're in this violent act, and now you're in the hole. And you're in the hole for mm-hmm. months and months and months on, a, on many occasions. Then you get transferred. What's it like when you're when you're living in the hole and you lay down at night? Do you ever just miss home or feel like, damn, man, I wish I was never involved in this type of stuff? Yeah, man. My dad struggled with multiple sclerosis my whole bit. And there was times where he was in the hospital or my family was dealing with something, a, a, a medical issue he had. And I would be like just beating myself up. I need to be there. I shouldn't be in here doing this dumb shit. Like <clears throat> I lost 365 good days on my first 10 years in my, in prison. I should have been out almost a year and a half earlier than I was towards the end of my bid. I don't know how many times I beat myself up over that. And I barely got to see my father right before he passed. I got to halfway house, May 12th. I got to see my dad, May 23rd. And he passed on the 28th. And it was bad. Like he was not there at the end. So like I, I go through that. I could, I mentally and emotionally like really tear myself up for the things I did as a kid thinking this is what we're supposed to do. Problem is, is you take that hit. The car don't take that hit. You take that hit. So you better be damn sure that what you're going to do is enough of a benefit to you and not just everybody else. Because nine times out of 10, it's not a benefit to you at all. I was going to ask you that, but you answered it. Mm-hmm. When you get out yeah. of prison, is your mom still alive? Yeah, my mom is still doing really well. Um, she's real supportive, but she struggles with, I went back, right? She thinks She's thinking to herself, what did I do wrong that he didn't get his shit together and not, and stay out? I didn't, I didn't keep from going back to prison um so i i really feel like she struggles with what could she have done differently and quite honestly i don't think there's anything it's all in here it's all me where's your mom at now is she in cali or no yeah she lives in sacramento she lives in um the other side of town from where i live are you you go see her spend some time with her let her know mom i love you yeah i uh i went by there the other day um it's tough 
because she's trying to figure her own stuff out and I'm trying to figure my own out. Um, we're kind of at a little gray area right now, trying to figure out where we stand. Um, me especially, because majority of my life has been in institutions. I go to therapy. I'm real big on therapy. So anybody who's got a question about where they're at mentally, I recommend therapy. Um, I'm in therapy. Um, I have, I'm dealing with some demons that I've brought out of prison with me. And um, it's a struggle, man. It's a real struggle. You talk about demons. What what are the demons? Um, sometimes I wake up and I don't realize I'm not in prison. Um, I'm super paranoid. I can't stay, stay in a crowded place um, without constantly surveying the environment. I got to have my back to a wall. Um, I got to be able to see who comes in and out the door. As soon as I walk into a room, I mark the exits. A lot of PTSD stuff. Um, you hear it's typical of people who have been to war and stuff like that. Listen, bro, I still deal with it. I had a hard time. I went to therapy, too, for the first year and a half. I yeah. called the parole officer and said, I need some help, man. I thought I was yeah. good when I walked out. That that happens to weirdos. I'm good. Yeah. And, and right. it happens to regular people, man. Yeah, that's it. I think we program ourselves to be, to survive in there. And somebody who's really close to me said, that's great. You did what you needed to do to survive. But now you need to do what you need to do to thrive. Because what we do to survive is not what we do to thrive. So I'm trying to get myself caught up into a mental headspace where I can thrive out here. I'm with you. You ever seen anybody get killed in there? First day in prison. First day at Lompoc. I was on the chain. So we got on the plane to Oklahoma City. And we had one stop. We stopped at Phoenix. And then the next stop was Vandenberg Air Force Base. There was an older cat, tattoos on his face. Um, he was telling me what it was going to be like and what to expect. We go through R&D, go through the whole medical and SIS and see the counselor and all that. And we're going to the unit. Longbox got this long corridor. And as I'm walking down this corridor, he's in front of me. Two dudes pop out from this little entryway and just start sticking him and I, i'm horrified this is my first experience with federal prison the guy who was telling me what to expect just got worked over and later we found out he died i'm not surprised the amount of blood that was on the ground was insane and like i was freaked out i got to the unit just like in shell shock i was like oh my god what am i doing for the next 25 years and, and these were white dudes white dudes yep he was part of a gang that couldn't be on the yard Shocking. Some of the stuff you see, some of the things you experience. No wonder why people have PTSD when they walk out. No man, no wonder why you watch the exits and you, you know, you sit with your back to the wall when you're at a restaurant, right? Right. And I think the more terrifying part is not that kind of case where a guy just shows up and they get him, but the case where guys have been friends for a year and then his friends end up killing him because that is a mental, like total mind grind because You've been he, hanging out, eating with this guy every day, and now you could just flip a switch and kill him. Like, to me, I, I have a hard time like even attacking somebody that I've been friends with because I know the person. I know their struggles. I know what they've been through. So it's tough. you got to get up a whole nother gear to be able to just flip that switch and attack them with a knife. It's like, wow. That's where we talk wow. about the compassion and how brutal people are and you know, I've seen it, man. For me, it's it, the most brutal were the white dudes and the natives on their own people. You know, and what you talk about, we see it with, with Sack, with Ricky Fackrell and them dudes, man. They, right. I, mean, I got the pictures from, from the morgue, bro. Like, I got them, you yeah. know. It's, uh, yeah, that that Herb Reuben attack was one of the most notorious in the system for a long time. Let's talk about let's talk about that. You know, I, I did that video the other day with David uh, Frank Jennings. He becomes an ARM member, right? A lot of people didn't know right. that video. Yeah. He was yeah, one of your he, pros, right? Yeah, he had what, like two months left before he was about to get out? No, he, had, that I think he, had, he got like a 60, 70 month sentence. He had like two years left. He had a release. Okay, so he, but he was short. And so, like, to me, like, when I got further along in my sentence, I had a little stroke on some of these yards. And I was always against sending the guy who was short to the gate or had a short sentence because there's so many of us had 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Why not us do it? But that issue right there, that was more of a political statement because 
of the whole JDL versus Nazi thing, like they were at war. So the way I understood it was he actually was the first to raise his hand and was like, I want this. And they crushed that dude's head. With you, it was a bag of bricks. Yeah, I'll send you the pictures. Have you seen the pictures? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, yeah, I mean, he decimates this dude. He's got two years left. Now he's got 35. You got another 35-year piece, right? So now yeah. he's going to get out when he's like 60. He gave his whole life away off of what mm -hmm. he believed in that day. And that's why I equated it to American History X. You let your beliefs get you a 35-year sentence. Those beliefs, you know, probably – not the best beliefs, at least not to me. I mean, no. I'm not going to go out there and do that, you know, with, with, with a two-year sentence. Line. It's not me, bro. Do you think he hesitated? Uh, do you think there was anything in his mind where he's like, damn, I wish I wouldn't have raised my hand, but now I got to do it? Because I've seen that a thousand times with young dudes. Probably. Because when you're with the fellas, it's like, yeah, this is cool. This is, this is what needs to happen. You're going to go put that demo down for us. But, like, after you raise your hand, you're thinking, but what happens if I kill this dude? You know they're going to charge me, and they did. They did. Let's talk about them, you know, the good white dudes, right? And, and you know, well, I mean, you always hear, like, hey, man, he's a good white dude, right? Why didn't yeah. none of them older cats step up and say, nah, bro, you got two years left, man. I'm, we got it, bro. Why, why, don't, why don't these good white dudes that got the 25, 30 years step up and say, nah, homie, we ain't going to let you do that, man? Because, you know, you, they promote, you know, the 14 words. They promote what they love, what they believe in. And yet you're going to let this young kid throw his whole life away. I've seen the manipulation. Like, I'm well aware at this point, like early on in my bit, I was being manipulated. I was the torpedo. I didn't realize that what I was doing was for the good of them, but I was going to have to carry it. Later on in my bid, which is what really kind of turned me off of the whole gang life, it gave me the, the way out with the drugs, but that whole mentality of let's use that hate and anger to get what we want just brings negativity into your life. So by welcoming that negative emotion, you also bring with it all the other negativity. And then you they use that as a manipulation for the younger kids. You set up this whole structure about how you have to do this and do that and do this. And then you can have some numbers tattooed on you. So really, Andy, what you're talking about is the manipulation, right? A lot of dudes manipulate people when really, you know, you see these old prison movies and you think, oh, well, you know what? You know, this is a young dude coming in. We're going to take him under our wing and we're going to teach him the right way. But it doesn't always happen that way. And it didn't happen for David. And now he's, you know, he's in prison pretty much till he's 62 years old. Went in at 24, right. going to get out when you're 62. And you should have got out when you were 28. Yeah, for sure. I think that prison is a master class for manipulation. I think if you're a narcissist or you're you're um, got some sort of uh, other grandiose personality disorder like megalomania, you'll be a star in there. But those people make a life out of living off of other people and using them, and they don't care. They're sociopaths. They don't. That doesn't bother them. They have no empathy. No empathy, right? But I feel like there are certain people that are like that. But I feel like there's a whole bunch of dudes in there that aren't like that. But they act like that because the shot caller or the big homie says, hey, bro, we got to do this. I think they pump each other up when really that isn't well, what they really mean in their heart. Well, I mean, on the face of it, nobody wants to be that guy who goes, hey, man, don't you think this kid, man, like he's got things going for him? You know, nobody wants to be the guy to go against the grain. So everybody's kind of like the, the river's flowing this way and they're just going with it, knowing damn well that that 26 year old kid or 25 year old kid doesn't need to be the one going to risk his the rest of his life to go take out some trash like it really there's plenty of lifers that can be doing this stuff and they're they're comfortable they've got everything they want going for they don't want to go to the shoe and get transferred because then they got to start all over so really they're thinking about themselves and not everybody else now i will say i have met some really good dudes who do genuinely care about youngsters and will protect them but there are those few that have the power on the yard who do manipulate and abuse uh, the weaker convict. 100%. And, you know, I know you had mentioned earlier, you had a little stroke for your ride, the ride that you were in. You ever have to send some dudes on a dummy mission where you're like, okay, let's, we'll use him. Unfortunately, there was a couple incidents where 
nobody wanted to go. And that kind of sucks when, when you're repping for, for a group and nobody wants to like take some of the responsibility. And then everybody looks to you like, well, you're just going to choose somebody, right? Well, I don't like doing things that way. I like having a consensus and then somebody saying, well, I'll do it. Well, when there's nobody saying I'll do it, then you kind of got to figure out a fair way to do it. And what I always did was took the wrong guy on the yard that had been there on the lo- on the yard the longest and say, okay, look, you've been here this long. You haven't done anything yet. It's your turn. Both the times that I had to do that, it turned out fine. You know, I just got tired of, man, half the removals were dudes that had checked in. And like a lot of those times, man, like, how do I prove that? How do I prove it's not? How, how as a, as a convict, if you don't come out and say like, what I always did is I took every lockup order I had the entire time I've been out. I have a stack of papers like this. Be like, here, this is what happened to me through my bid. So there was no question about why I went to the shoe ever. But like a lot of guys, then nobody tells them, hey, keep your lockup orders. So they don't know. So they can't prove anything. You know, all that time that you did, what was your biggest regret? Because you missed out on the best years of your life. I mean, me and you both went to prison at around the same age and got out probably around the same age. What were your biggest regrets? Um, missing out on the birth of my two nieces. Um, they're like the closest thing I have to daughters. You know what I mean? I love them kids to death. Um, not being there for my sister when she got married. Um, not being there for my dad when he was sick. Those things eat at me still and probably will for the rest of my life because I was away because I made a decision that was stupid and irresponsible. Had it been for anything that like I could actually say was worth something, not just hurt a bunch of people and ruin my own life, I could probably deal with it better. But that because of the reason I went to prison and the stupidity of it all and then hurting people throughout the process, that that kills me. Did did you catch a violation or no, Andy? Yeah, yeah. I, I went back for um substance abuse. I did not have a handle on my um my addiction. I think I've got it knocked out now, but it's now it's a daily I'm not today. It's not today. Because before it was like, oh well, I'll just maybe I'll dabble here and there and get away with it. And now it's in my mind of if I dabble once, I go back to prison. So I don't mess around. You know, you end up going back. Where'd you go back on a violation to? I just went to County. They had me in County the whole time. By the time I had done it all, the judge was like, okay, well, it's going to be six months in a three month rehab. It was a class C violation. I know you're doing your TikTok and all of that. You ever worry Mm -hmm. about going back to the penitentiary because you're on social media? Uh, yeah, because old school rules are it's a no no. Even though that almost everybody gets out and has something on their TikTok about it, the bigger guys, you know, like you and me, and if you got over ten thousand followers, you've you've probably had some people say some stuff to you that's like, oh man, if I go back, yeah, that's probably not going to be good. <laughs> it's a good idea not to go back, right? Yeah, right, right. It's just another just another reason to stay free, and, and it's a good reason. You know, before we get ready to go, I'm going to tell you this, dude. I really hope that you do conquer your addiction. You're still young, man. You still got your whole life ahead of you. You know, we missed on we missed out on too much, man, to let it all go again. And like you said, one day at a time, bro. When, when you feel that, you know, you get into that position, you feel that urge, just think about, man, do, is that how I really want to live? Do I really want to go back? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I appreciate the advice, man. Andy, you seem like a pretty good dude. I don't know. I, I felt like when I seen you that we we were somewhere together. I don't know exactly where. Maybe it was just in transit. But I feel like, yeah. man, I know this dude from somewhere. But anyway, man, I want to see you do good. I know you got a TikTok. Tell people how they can find you on TikTok. Check out some. You're, you got some good videos on there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Come check me out. I'm on TikTok on First Day Out 916 Andy. On Instagram, um, I'm Andy Goltz 916. And uh, my YouTube channel, which is just starting, um, is also Andy Goltz 916. I'm going to link your YouTube channel. I'll put your, your TikTok links in there and all of that. You you send them to me. I'm going to put them on there. Um, right. and I'm going to put your cash app up, bro. Anybody that wants to donate to Andy, he's struggling. He's doing Uber Eats. He's, you can see where he's living. He needs to get a picture on that back wall. So let's help Andy out tonight and get him a picture. You know, and I hope things work out for you. People, I'm going to let, you know, not let. I'm going to tell people, hey, go check this dude's YouTube out. Let's support him. 
you know, let's, let's push people, man. Let's push people right. that are here trying to do the right thing. But anyway, man, before we go, anything you want to say? Man, just pay attention to your life, man. Make good decisions. Think about consequences of your actions always. If I had done that, I would never be in the position I got ended up in. Dude, you got one of the craziest stories ever, man. Just a kid screwing around, changes the the, the knob on on the train, and someone loses their life, and they're talking about giving you the death penalty, and in the end, you get 25 years, man. Wild, wild story. But anyway, Andy, I appreciate you coming on. I'm going to tell people if you like what we're doing, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button with respect. Load on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out. Thank you.